Well, hello everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. I know you haven't heard from me in a while. Work is kicking my butt, and I'm working a lot of overtime, but thank you all for being patient with me, and yeah, that's all I have to say. <laughs> so let's get back to it, right? Everyone is waiting on a new video, and I've got one for you. For the ones that do not like fictional stories, this video will not be for you. Just a heads up, so you can go ahead and click away. For everyone else who would like to stick around, here we go. Just for future reference, if the word true is not in the title of the video, please know that it will be fictional. I get a lot of questions about that. As well, this video will have underlying ominous music playing, just enough to give that anxiety-inducing feeling. If you are new here, and you enjoy what you are hearing, please consider joining us by hitting that subscribe button and turning your notification bell to all. That way you'll be reminded of every time I upload a story. If you would like to learn how to become a member, that information can be found down below. Without further ado, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person every day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of fictional vocal melatonin entitled Horrific Falsity Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Listen, son, I know you love your grandma, and so do I. There's just some things we need to watch out for. She puts her heart into all she does. One of those is the dolls. She gave you Rosie and modeled a baby doll after you. I think you're old enough now to know my rules around the dolls. These apply now and always. Number one, have respect for her dolls. I know, I know you do, but you may forget this when you're older. Treat them with the respect you give someone at their funeral. Number two, grandma must not be left alone with any little girls between one and nine years old, especially fair skinned ones. Young boys with long hair should also be supervised. She's never had a baby doll besides the little Jack, but Let's not chance it. Number three, for safety, don't leave older girls with her unless grandpa or I are there. If she starts, say, touching their hair or saying something about keeping her, separate them immediately. Number four, if she asks you to set up the dolls in a certain way, do it. If she says a doll likes this or that, do it. This can appease them both. Some things are just her requests, and some are the dolls. I don't know which dolls are actually inanimate. Number five, if the dolls look at you, don't worry, they know you. If you have someone new around and they look, keep them close and watch. They are usually just curious, but be safe. Number six, if you break a doll, get grandpa he'll know exactly what to do if grandma finds you first be honest she'll be upset but she won't hurt you if someone outside the family broke it take the fall for their sake do you understand good uh, oh and one more thing when talking to non-family leave details out about grandma's hobbies most don't like the combination of doll making and taxidermy. What? You thought it was the same thing? Uh, I can see why, since she says they are. I've been a professional cleaner for years, specializing in old abandoned properties. It's not a glamorous job, but it pays well. 
and have always enjoyed the solitude. However, my latest assignment has left me questioning everything I thought I knew about the world. It started like any other job. I was hired by a wealthy client to clean out a mansion that had been in his family for generations. The place was massive, with dozens of rooms filled with dust and forgotten furniture. My client, Mr. Dawson, gave me strict instructions to leave the attic alone. He said it was full of old family memorabilia, and he would handle it himself. Curiosity has always been my weakness. After a week of cleaning, I couldn't resist the urge to take a peek. One afternoon, while Mr. Dawson was out, I climbed the narrow staircase to the attic. The door was locked, but a quick search through the old house yielded an old key that fit perfectly. The attic was unlike any other part of the house. It was dark and musty with a single window covered in grime. As I moved my flashlight around, I noticed a strange metallic smell in the air. The space was filled with old trunks and covered furniture. But one thing caught my eye immediately. A large, ornate mirror leaning against the far wall, with an intricately carved frame that seemed out of place in the dusty attic. I approached it cautiously, my flashlight beam bouncing off the glass. As I got closer, I saw something move in the reflection. My heart skipped a beat, and I spun around, but there was nothing there. I turned back to the mirror, and my blood ran cold. The reflection showed the attic as it was, but there was a figure standing behind me, a tall, shadowy man with glowing red eyes. I felt a chill run down my spine as the figure raised a hand and pointed directly at me. I stumbled back, knocking over an old trunk. The figure in the mirror started to move, slowly stepping closer. My instincts screamed at me to run, but my legs felt like lead. Just as the figure was about to reach the surface of the mirror, I snapped out of my paralysis and bolted for the door. I slammed the attic door shut behind me and locked it. My heart pounded in my chest as I leaned against the door, trying to catch my breath. I could hear faint whispers coming from the other side, but... I couldn't make out any words. The metallic smell seemed to linger around me, clinging to my clothes. I decided to leave the mansion that night. I packed my things and left a note for Mr. Dawson, explaining that I couldn't continue the job. As I drove away, I glanced back at the house and saw a figure standing in the attic window, watching me. A few days later, I received a call from Mr. Dawson. He sounded frantic, asking me if I had gone into the attic. I admitted that I had, and he cursed under his breath. He told me that the mirror had been in his family for centuries and that it was cursed. Anyone who saw the figure in the mirror was doomed to be haunted by it for the rest of their lives. I thought he was crazy, but the nightmares began almost immediately. Every night, I dream of the attic and the figure with the red eyes. I feel its cold presence watching me, waiting for the moment when I let my guard down. I've moved twice since then, but the dreams follow me wherever I go. I've tried to destroy the mirror in my dreams, but it always reappears, untouched. I'm writing this as a warning. If you're ever cleaning out an old house and find a hidden attic. Leave it alone. Some secrets are better left undisturbed. Being a moderator for the No Sleep Forum wasn't what you'd call glamorous. My job was straightforward enough. Enforce the rules, keep the stories within the guidelines, and make sure the community didn't veer into chaos. But 
Every once in a while, things went off script, like this time. I had just taken down a post accused of bandwagoning. The usual stuff. Some story similar to another that had gone viral. Only, this time, I knew the author was innocent. The accusations were a stretch, and removing the post felt like the right thing to do. Still, the backlash was immediate. The author fired off angry messages, laced with curses, each one angrier than the last, until his frustration turned into something more visceral. A strange chill crawled down my spine as I sat at my desk, like a cold hand running against my skin. The room seemed to shift, the familiar creaks and groans of the old house suddenly louder, more deliberate. The floor beneath me began to vibrate, then crack and moan like something ancient and unspeakable was stirring below, ready to claw its way up. Then the pain hit. My chest felt like it was being squeezed in a vice. Each beat of my heart was a battle, the rhythm stuttering, struggling to keep going. The pressure was suffocating, as though my own bones were closing in on themselves, threatening to crush me from the inside out. And that's when I saw it. I turned my head, and in the corner of the room, there it was, a figure standing in the shadows, so still that I almost doubted it was real. But it was real. Its pale skin clung tightly to its bones, bat-like wings twitching behind it, horns twisting from its skull like the twisted branches of a dead tree. Its eyes glowed a furious, hateful red, cutting through the dim light, watching me, waiting. I turned back to my monitor, as though ignoring it might make it disappear, but my chest still throbbed with pain, and there on the screen was a message. Hell will be the only home you know when I drag you there myself. Each word burned into my mind, searing like a brand, and I felt my grip on reality slipping. My vision blurred, the pain in my chest became unbearable, and then... nothing. When I came to, the world had changed. I wasn't in my room anymore. I was... somewhere else. Somewhere wrong. The sky overhead was a swirling mass of molten orange and gray, smoke choking the air. The stench of sulfur hit me like a punch, thick and acrid, sticking in my throat. The sun was no longer the comforting ball of light I knew. Here it was a sickly red smear in the sky, casting everything in an eerie blood-soaked glow. Ahead of me, towering mountains stood like jagged teeth, belching smoke and ash. Rivers of molten lava cut through the landscape, bubbling and hissing as they ate through the scorched earth. People, no, not people, not anymore, were running, screaming, trying to escape the horrors that prowled the land. The screamers came first. Thin, skeletal creatures with spindly limbs and hollow eyes that glowed green. Their mouths were wide, gaping open unnaturally, letting out shrieks that made my ears bleed. Just hearing them sent me to the edge of madness. Then, the chained fiends appeared. Their bodies grotesque and bound in thick, rusted iron chains. Each step they took was agony, their skin raw and blistered, the chains scraping against their flesh. With every movement, the jagged spikes that lined their bodies tore deeper, spilling more blood onto the ground. The clashing of their chains was a discordant melody of pain. And then there were the infernal hounds, massive twisted beasts 
their fur singed away to reveal molten, glowing scales underneath. Their jaws dripped with venom that hissed and sizzled as it hit the ground. Their eyes locked onto me, burning with a malevolence that chilled me more than any scream or chain ever could. It was a nightmare, but more than that, it was real. Too real. And then, there it was again. The creature from my room, standing before me now, its wings folded against its back, its face a mask of pure malice. Up close, I could see every horrible detail, its skin stretched tight over bones, eyes burning with cruel amusement, horns twisting like the roots of some foul tree. It stared at me, grinning. How unlucky you are to have two faces, it said in a voice that was smooth, mocking. And both of them are truly ugly. Before I could react, it was upon me its long, bony fingers reaching out. One sharp nail dragged slowly, deliberately across my face, cutting deep. The pain was sharp and immediate, like fire licking at my skin. Something for you to remember, it said, its grin widening. For when you wake up. Wh what are you? I managed to whisper, though I... I already knew the answer. It smiled again, slow and wicked, as if savoring the moment. I'm the devil, it said. And when you die, you'll see this face again, over and over, while we tear you apart. And then, with a snap of its fingers, the world collapsed into darkness. I woke up at my desk. The screen was still on. The message from the author staring back at me. My hand flew up to my face. And sure enough, there was a thin, burning cut just where the creature had marked me. I don't know what happened. I don't know if it was a dream, a hallucination, or something worse. But that mark is real, and so is the terror gnawing at my soul. One thing is for sure, I need to change, I need to be better, for myself, for the next person I might cross paths with, and maybe, just maybe, to keep from ever seeing that face ever, ever again. The wardrobe had been purchased from an old antique shop that my mother frequented. It was an old wooden wardrobe with brass handles and the name Simon, presumably the former owner, was etched into the back. For the first few days, things were relatively normal, despite the wardrobe doors seemingly opening on their own. But then came the noises, always late at night that sounded very similar to a horse's hooves on the stone floor, coming from the wardrobe, along with a chilly breeze blowing out from the cracks of the wooden doors. It's just your tired brain playing tricks on you. I try to convince myself. It's all in your head. I told myself that for four nights, as I ignored the, quite frankly, terrifying sounds coming from the wardrobe which I never had enough courage to open. But on the fifth night, I had had enough of the sleepless nights. I was tired of the absolute terror every night due to my brain filling in the blanks of the many horrifying possibilities waiting for me behind the wooden doors. I got up from my bed with only the moonlight beaming through the open blinds. My heart was racing fast as I slowly made my way towards the wardrobe, feeling that now familiar breeze through the cracks, only now much more intense, like a strong wind was blowing from the other side. 
slowly reaching out as I pulled the brass handles. The doors creaked loudly, moaning as they opened. The darkness inside the wardrobe was so heavy and dense that it was like staring into an absolute void of nothingness. Anything could live in that darkness, I thought, which didn't do much to help my nerves. I slowly and hesitantly reached out both arms, plunging them into the wardrobe, reaching out far, yet never meeting the back. I then stepped into the wardrobe, just as Lucy did in C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Only, this was certainly not Narnia. There was no snow or friendly fawns offering cups of tea. Only a narrow, arched stone tunnel greeted me. What is this place? I had thought, not having a fucking clue what was going on. Am I dreaming? I wiped my eyes in disbelief, then stared down the long passageway, which was heavily blanketed in darkness. I felt endless as I blindly felt my way down the narrow passage, my breathing heavy, my heart beating like the drums of our war inside my chest. To say that I was terrified would be an understatement. I don't think this is a good idea. The rational part of my brain told me. But it's not every day you find something like this, said the more curious side of my brain. Continuing on through the passage, my eyes finally began to adjust to the darkness just a little, and I noticed the walls were dripping with some kind of moisture, which, upon closer inspection, felt way too thick between my finger and thumb to have been water and smelled strange. After a while, I finally approached a bend in the passageway. Looking down the new hallway, which was just as dark and narrow as the last, I felt a sense of unease, like something was watching me in that darkness. I could feel it in my bones. I debated whether I should continue on or head back to the safety of my bedroom and forget this place even existed. But that wasn't going to happen. I needed to know what this place was. So, curiosity drove me forward, down the new passageway. As I continued on, I came to realize the absolute silence of this place, an unsettling quiet that brought many terrifying thoughts to mind. Maybe I should turn back now. My eyes were endlessly darting around the darkness. My breathing was growing heavier as my heart raced faster. Each step I took became slower and slower as I hesitantly continued on. After a while, I reached the dead end. All of this for nothing, I thought, as I stared at the stone wall in defeat. Feeling exhausted, I leaned against the side wall to rest a little before heading back. As soon as I leaned against the wall, a hidden door opened behind me, causing me to fall onto my back and knocking the wind right out of my lungs. What in the... I slowly sat up, confused. What? Where am I now? This hidden passage was much wider than the others, a lot taller too. I got onto my feet and brushed myself off, squinting into the darkness as I looked in my new surroundings. Ahead were three arched tunnels, which each appeared to be branching in a different path, one left, another right, the last headed straight on from what I could see. Which way? I thought, scratching my head. Before I could make my decision, I was startled by a noise in the darkness behind me. It sounded like footsteps, bare feet on a stone floor, slowly getting closer. I suddenly screamed as a hand grabbed my shoulder. Shh, 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 be quiet, came a whisper. I turned around to see a pudgy boy standing there with his finger pressed against his lips. Who are you? I replied. I'm sorry to scare you, the boy replied, still whispering. My name is Milo. Why are you whispering? It would be best if you also whispered too, 
Miley replied with a serious look in his eyes. We don't want that thing finding us. Uh, what thing? I added, confused and a little terrified. Milo's eyes suddenly looked frightened. A monster. Wait, what? I muttered, feeling a strong urge to turn back. Milo changed the subject. How did you end up in here anyway? My wardrobe, I replied. What about you? The same, he said. I just walked into the wardrobe and ended up stuck here in this maze. Uh, what do you mean stuck? I asked. Milo chuckled nervously. <laughs> um, haven't you figured it out yet? Figured out what? Milo suddenly looked serious. There is no leaving this place. I couldn't fully understand what he was saying, or maybe I didn't want to understand. Maybe it was better I didn't hear any of this. I'm going home, I said, eyeing the walls, trying to remember which way I had tumbled in. Good luck with that, Milo said. I tried to find the way I had come in, but couldn't. My hands felt blindly along the cold walls, trying to find the escape. You won't find it, Milo said. Besides, even if you did, it wouldn't lead you back the way you came. Uh, what? This place, it shifts around all the time, Milo replied. When the door closes, another opens in its place. What are you talking about? I said. Milo moved closer. What I'm trying to say is that there is no going back. How do you know all of this? I asked. I have been here for hours now. Milo looked down to the floor. I tried going back and all it did was lead me somewhere else. No, no, no. There must be a way, I said, feeling desperate to be back safely in my bed again. If there is, I haven't found it, Milo replied. The tunnels, I thought. One of them could lead me to a way out. We need to go down one of these tunnels. I stood in front of the three passageways. But which one? Well, I came in here through the right one, so either the left or the middle, Milo replied. Let's try the middle, I said. We wandered the narrow tunnel for what seemed like hours before meeting another impasse. Two more diverging passageways stood to the left and the right. Which way? I asked. Uh, left? Milo didn't seem so sure. We turned left and made our way down another same old tunnel, which I was already growing tired of seeing. Are all the tunnels identical? I asked. Uh, pretty much, Milo replied. We continued on for a while, until a noise emerging from the darkness ahead made the both of us stop dead in our tracks. Uh, what is that? I timidly said, almost inaudibly. Milo's chubby face had gone as pale as a ghost, a look of pure terror, a lost boy who wanted his mommy. The noise was getting louder, I recognize that sound, I thought. The clopping of hooves on stone continued to echo from ahead, followed by a sound, much like that which a bull makes when its nostrils before a charge, a huffing sound. It's the monster, Milo said, his eyes wide with fright. Two angry crimson eyes peered from a huge horn silhouette ahead still too obstructed by darkness to see, yet the monstrosity of that outline was enough to make me run. Milo began running too, all the while the clopping grew louder and heavier behind us. Keep going, don't stop, I said, looking over at Milo, who was beginning to tire out. I caught one quick glimpse over my shoulder at that creature chasing us and screamed, before quickly picking up my pace. I, I, I can't keep up, Milo shouted, barely able to catch his breath. 
A bullish bellow erupted from behind as its hooves began to quicken, moving at a frightening speed too fast for poor fat Milo to outrun. Keep going, I shouted as a turn appeared ahead. Milo was struggling as we turned the corner, his breathing very labored and wheezing. Don't stop, Milo. Keep going, I shouted. We had been running for a while before either of us realized that that thing was no longer chasing us. It seemingly retreated back into the shadows, waiting for its opportunity to strike again. I really thought I was a goner then, Milo said, collapsing to the floor, exhausted. We need to keep going, I said, before helping Milo back onto his feet. I don't like how it just stopped chasing like that. I'm so tired. Milo's breathing was still heavy. We can rest once we know it's safe. We both continued on down the narrow tunnel. One thing was for certain. Milo was right about this place shifting. That thing had caused us to turn back the way we had come. Yet, now, there are different bends and labyrinthine tunnels branching in all directions. In fact, this was the most disorienting place of them all. Didn't we just take this turn? Milo said. I'm not even sure anymore, I replied. As we tried to gather our bearings, a sound echoed from one of the tunnels. It sounded like a dog barking, followed by a girl's voice. Rocco, get here now, the girl's voice echoed. Can you hear that? Milo asked. I think it's coming from down there. I pointed to the tunnel to our right. We followed the sound until it eventually grew louder. A golden Labrador suddenly leaped out of the darkness and ran straight towards us, tongue out, tail wagging. I knelt down to greet the dog, but Milo kept his distance. You're a friendly boy, ain't ya? I said, scratching behind his ears. The girl's voice was now very close as she called out again. Rocco, where are you? Over here, I called. A confused blonde-haired girl walked out of the darkness. Um, hello. The dog immediately ran over to her. Don't you run off again, she scolded the dog, before turning to us. Uh, who are you? We introduced ourselves. I'm Ruby, and this is Rocco, she said, patting the dog's head. What is this place? I don't know, I replied, just as baffled as she was. How did you get here? Milo asked. I left my wardrobe door open and Rocco ran inside. She paused for a moment, trying to wrap her brain around the very strange situation. I ran after him and here I am, wherever here is. That's so strange, Milo said. What is? Ruby replied. That is how we got here, in the wardrobe. Well, how do I get back home? She asked. We don't know, Milo and I both said in unison. Anyway, getting out of here is the last of our concerns, Milo said, looking frightened once again. Huh? Ruby was confused. Don't worry, I said, not wanting to frighten her. What are you not telling me? She demanded to know. I looked over at Milo, who looked back at me with fearful eyes. Um, well, uh, <laughs> you see, we, <laughs> we ain't alone here, I finally mumbled. Well, duh, Ruby replied, rolling her eyes. I can see that. No, you don't get it, Milo piped in. He is not talking about us. Still not making any sense, Ruby shrugged. There's a monster here, I blurted, feeling dread building in my stomach. It chased me and Milo earlier. <laughs> yeah, right, she chuckled. Rocco suddenly bolted from Ruby's side and disappeared into the darkness ahead. That dumb dog, Ruby sighed. Rocco, get here now. Be quiet. Milo said nervously. Ruby ignored him and started to chase after Rocco. Hey, don't go off alone, I called out. 
she was already beginning to disappear into the darkness. We chased after her, hearing Rocco's playful barks ahead, followed by Ruby's voice calling out to him in a foolishly loud tone. That thing's gonna hear her, Milo panicked. It was already too late. Rocco's playful barks were now frightened whimpers echoing from the darkness. Rocco, Ruby shouted. The whimpers had now turned into a growl, which was followed by a screeching yelp. Rocco! The dog's yelp soon died down in a deafening silence. We need to turn back, right now. Milo grabbed my shoulder, his hand trembling violently. We need to get Ruby, I said, trying to gather enough courage to venture further down the tunnel. The clopping of hooves had now replaced the silence of an atmosphere of dread. It's found us. My heart was beating so fast in my chest as I ran ahead to get Ruby. I genuinely believed it was going to explode out of my chest at any moment. Milo tried to call me back, but I just couldn't leave her. I continued on without him. I finally found Ruby, who was standing like a deer in headlights. Ruby, we need to run, now, I said, grabbing her hand. I'm not leaving Rocco, she said, tears welling in her eyes. I won't. She broke free of my hand and started to run ahead, yet soon paused when two crimson eyes appeared in the darkness ahead. What is that? She mumbled, her tear-filled eyes full of fear. A blood-curdling bellow suddenly permeated the tunnel like that of a raging bull. The clopping quickened in pace, shaking the ground with a tremor. Ruby and I ran back to Milo, who was still standing nervously where he had been. Run! I screamed. We ran as fast as we could, all the while that thing was hot in pursuit behind us. Keep going and don't look back, I shouted, panicking. We ran through the labyrinthine tunnels with their enclosed twists and turns only serving to disorient us amid the chaos and panic of the heavy thudding clops behind. It's catching up, Ruby screamed. Milo's pudgy face was red with fluster and his breathing like that of an asthmatic having an attack. I can't keep going. The fear in Milo's wheezy voice was very evident. Don't you give up, I yelled. Milo suddenly collapsed to the floor. Milo, I screamed. G go on with that. <laughs> Ruby and I both watched in horror as two large, hairy, clawed hands emerged from the darkness and wrapped around Milo's ankles, dragging him screaming into the shadows. I tried to run after him, but Ruby pulled me back. Don't leave me, she said crying. Milo's screams became more distant until eventually there was only silence. Neither Ruby or I said a word as we quietly tiptoed down the identical tunnels. You could have saved him, the guilt in my brain said. Ruby would occasionally wipe away tears and snot as we made our way through the nightmarish maze. We need to rest, I said, feeling exhausted. I sat down and rested against the wall in defeat. I no longer had thoughts of seeing home again, didn't think there was any escaping at all. This was to be our tomb. We're going to die here, aren't we? Ruby sobbed. I couldn't do anything to reassure her, when I too believed the same thing. There was no way we could outrun that beast forever. Besides, even if the creature didn't get to us, thirst and starvation definitely would. I'm so tired, I thought. My eyelids became heavy as I rested more into the wall. I couldn't remember dozing off, but I was suddenly awoken by Ruby shaking me. Can you hear that? She said, pointing to the end of the tunnel. It's coming from down there. In fact, I could. It was like this whooshing of water. I quickly got up to my feet and rubbed my eyes before looking into the dark veil ahead. It's a way out, Ruby said, grabbing my arm. 
Let's go. Wait, I said, releasing my arm from her grip. We don't know what's down there. It's our only hope. We have to try, Ruby pleaded. I reluctantly went ahead as Ruby followed behind. A draft whistled from ahead the bend as we inched closer to the source of the sound, which was getting much louder now. I timidly peeked around the bend, expecting to see another identical arch tunnel, yet finding a spacious expanse. What the... I was jaw-dropped. The sound of a waterfall beating down hard upon a river flowing between trees that bore fruit, as well as a broad array of foliage and sharp-looking thorns twining around black rocks. But, best of all, there was light, though where it was coming from remained a mystery. Wow. Ruby's eyes held the same amazement as my own. For just a brief moment, that sadness in her expression was a glimmer of hope. I watched as she barged past me and went straight towards the river, knelt down, cupping her hands into the flowing water before bringing it to her lips for a grateful gulp. It tastes funny, Ruby said, gagging a little. What the fuck is that? Don't drink anymore, I said, approaching the river for a better look. The water was clear and semi-clean looking. I say semi because there were tiny black specks floating around in there. What did she just drink? I thought. The fruit has to be fine, right? Ruby said as she approached one of the trees and picked one of the few apples that she could reach. I'm so hungry. I watched as she took a big bite into the apple and once again her face scowled as a red liquid dribbled down her chin. She quickly spat it out, then began to vomit. It tastes like blood. I took a look at the discarded apple on the ground. The flesh of the fruit looked like a literal flesh, all meaty and gristly, with blood spurting from a tiny vein which Ruby had severed with her teeth. Jesus fucking Christ. I couldn't have hid the horror on my face if I had tried. What the hell is this place? Ruby was still heaving. Something etched into one of the tree trunks suddenly caught my eye. Something was written into the bark. It read, Tina. Who is Tina? I thought, making my way over to one of the other trees and seeing the same etching into the bark. Only, this one read, Nathan. An uneasy feeling rose in the pit of my stomach, telling me that this was a place we never should have found. I don't like this place, I said, looking over to Ruby. I think we should leave. Before Ruby could reply, a sound from the tunnel ahead made my heart almost jump out of my chest. Clop, 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 echoed from the dark veil of the tunnel. Quick! Hide, I whispered, pulling Ruby behind a bush. With just the sound of our panicked breaths in our ears, we both watched as the creature emerged from the tunnel, carrying Milo's body in one huge clawed hand. This was the moment where I actually laid eyes upon the creature in full light. The only way that I can truly describe it would be that it resembled a bull on two legs with huge twisted horns that looked sharp and jagged and crimson eyes that glowed like embers, all atop a body, all hairy and ape-like despite the two hooves for its feet. It carried Milo over to a heap of soil where a hole had been dug already. Then, carefully, like a gardener planting some flowers, it lowered Milo's limp body into the hole feet first. What is it doing? Ruby whispered. Shh. I hushed her. It then began to pack soil into the hole, while ensuring that Milo remained in an upright position as it did so. Ruby and I both watched as the creature then stood over Milo, who was about half protruding from the soil, now standing upright on his own. 
That thing then began to perform a gesture into the air, using one of its claws, drawing some kind of symbol, which caused Milo's, or should I say not Milo's, now whitened eyes to open, before letting out a deafening inhuman shriek. His head then began jolting, left to right, up and down, all the while that ear-piercing shriek continued. Not Milo's lifeless gaze fell upon the bush in which we were hiding behind, and the shrieking suddenly stopped, leaving behind an uncomfortable silence. His gaze curiously scanned the area, like a cat seeing a mouse scuttle out of the corner of its eye. Ruby and I ducked, hoping we hadn't been seen. His gaze had caught the creature's attention as it too turned to face the bush. Shh. My eyes wide with fear as I looked at Ruby with my finger pressed to my lips. We need to get out of here, I thought, tapping Ruby on the arm, gesturing her to keep low and head for the tunnel behind us. I watched as she went first, crouched as low as possible, as she quietly crept over to the tunnel. All the while, Milo's gaze was still in our direction, like a searchlight scanning every inch of ground for an intruder. Ruby was almost to the tunnel when all of a sudden, Milo began to shriek again before screaming in a voice not in his own. Over there. The fire in the creature's eyes suddenly grew more redder. The creature's gaze had now found Ruby as it watched her for a moment before kicking up soil with its hooves, readying for a charge, as it bellowed with rage. Run! I screamed to Ruby as I quickly got up from behind the bush and ran for the tunnel. Not Milo's inhuman voice now carried with it a mocking tone. There's nowhere to hide. The creature began its charge, dashing straight for us at a frightening pace. We ran for the tunnel, each time looking over our shoulder to see that thing not far behind. You are going to die here. Not Milo's inhuman voice continued to taunt. Nobody escapes the labyrinth. The tunnel was just ahead as we picked up our pace to reach it before that thing caught up. The Minotaur will get you. <laughs> he continued, his laugh like that of a cackling witch. Just like it got me. <laughs> just as we made it to the tunnel entrance, the creature bounded with an unnatural leap and landed in front of our escape, blocking it. <laughs> no running away this time, not Milo chuckled. Ruby and I backed away from the huge monstrosity which was standing dominantly in front of the entrance. It then began to slowly clop towards us, no longer with haste, but with a casual stride inching closer and closer. We continued backing away, knowing at any moment that thing would tear us to shreds. All the while, it continued to menacingly approach at a slow pace. It was enjoying our fear. I grabbed the biggest rock from the ground and held it tightly in my grip. I'm not going down without a fight. Ruby stood behind me, shivering with fright and crying in panic. The redness of the creature's eyes brightened, glowing like two angry suns as steam angrily escaped from its nostrils. It was directly in front of us now. I readied the rock high, prepared to strike, to do so as much damage as I could before I was killed. The creature bellowed, standing dominantly tall above me, as it raised its huge clawed hand, ready to swipe my head clean off with one swoop. With fear in my eyes and my heart beating like crazy, I clenched my teeth, gripping the rock harder in my grasp, ready to go out with a fight. Just as it was about to strike, it suddenly paused, listening intently to a sound echoing from the tunnel to our left. It was the sound of a dog barking, getting closer. Rocco, 
Ruby's eyes widened. Suddenly, emerging from the dark tunnel, was a golden blur darting from the shadows, teeth bared and growling. As Rocco leapt at the creature, biting down hard on its arm, the creature let out a rageful bellow, then flung Rocco hard against the tree. No! Ruby screamed. Rocco struggled to his paws, whimpering as he did so. The creature then began to approach the wounded dog, ready to finish the job. Ruby picked up a rock and charged, flailing it around in the air. Leave him alone! Before I could stop her, she lunged at the creature. I watched as she ran at the creature in a blind rage and repeatedly hit it in the leg with the rock to no effect. Before Rocco could make it to her aid, the creature gored Ruby straight through her eye with one of its horns. She dropped like a sack of potatoes to the ground. Ruby, I screamed. Rocco growled more fiercely than before, and with what little strength he had left, he leapt at the creature once again, biting hard onto its face, ripping and tearing in a frenzy of rage as the beast bellowed in pain. Then, with a loud clack, Rocco's teeth clamped down hard onto one of his horns before crunching down hard and snapping the horn off. The horn dropped to the floor and Rocco jumped again, then proceeded to bite down hard onto its leg. The creature kicked Rocco away, bellowing in frustration but the dog got straight back up and lunged once again. I have to help him, I thought, my eyes suddenly falling onto the sharp horn laying on the ground, still dripping with Ruby's blood. I picked up the horn, readying it like a spear. Hey, over here. It kicked Rocco away again. Then it turned to me. Rocco got back up and was back on its leg, ripping pieces of its flesh away. Without thinking, I charged, holding the horn out in front of me, and plunged it deep into the side of the beast, who bellowed in agony before collapsing to the ground with a great thud. I watched as the crimson ember eyes of the beast gradually dimmed, dying down to darkness as it took its final breath. Rocco limped over to Ruby's body, then curled up next to her, whining with grief. I'm so sorry, boy, I said, patting Rocco's head, tears welling in my eyes. It can't be. Not Milo's white stare shot in my direction. Nobody can beat the Minotaur, he screamed. I approached not Milo, who was flailing him round in the hole, panicking. Well, guess what, I said, looking at the thing which had once been Milo. I just did. Fuck you, not Milo screamed, his white eyes completely lifeless. I can't just leave him like this, I thought, before picking up a rock. But first, I needed to know that he was not there anymore. Milo, if you were still in there somewhere, let me know, I said, hoping that he was. <laughs> Milo's dead. Not Milo chuckled. Gone forever. With a sickening crunch, I repeatedly bashed his head in with the rock until it was nothing but a green mush of fuck knows what. I then turned away and went back over to Rocco, who hadn't moved from Ruby's side. Come on, boy. Let's find a way out of this place. Rocco limped by my side through the labyrinthine passageways for two days before finally... A literal light at the end of the tunnel guided me back to the safety of my bedroom, where I emerged from the wardrobe with Rocco limping behind. What was days in the labyrinth had only been mere minutes in reality, and lying to my mother about how I would suddenly got a dog in the middle of the night was not easy. But she did let me keep him, and he went on to give me seven loving years before passing away peacefully in his sleep. I had never told anybody about the labyrinth before. In fact, this has been the first time I have thought about that place in a long time. Almost 20 years to be exact. It feels good to finally get it off my chest.
This next story has three parts. I'll let you know which parts I'll be reading firsthand. Part 1 I had always loved the small, picturesque town of Miller's Crossing, a place where everyone knew each other and crime was practically non existent. So, when I inherited my grandmother's old Victorian house on the edge of town, I was thrilled. My grandma had passed away a few months back, leaving behind a lifetime of memories and a house filled with antique furniture and dusty knickknacks. I decided to move in temporarily to sort through her belongings and maybe get a change of scenery. The first few days were uneventful. I spent most of my time cleaning, organizing, and occasionally chatting with the friendly neighbors who stopped by to offer condolences and share stories about my grandma. It wasn't until the fourth night that things started to get strange. It began with the knocking. I was in bed, just about to drift off to sleep, when I heard a soft, rhythmic knocking coming from downstairs. At first, I thought it was just the old house settling, but the knocks were too deliberate, too patterned to be random creaks. I got up, grabbed the flashlight I kept on the nightstand, and cautiously made my way downstairs. The knocking continued, echoing through the empty halls. It seemed to be coming from the basement. I hesitated at the top of the basement stairs, the flashlight beam trembling slightly in my hand. I took a deep breath and descended, one creaky step at a time. When I reached the bottom, the knocking stopped. I swept the flashlight around the basement, illuminating dusty shelves and cobweb, covered furniture but I didn't see anything out of the ordinary. I shrugged it off as my imagination playing tricks on me and went back to bed. The next morning, I found something odd. In the kitchen, on the small table where my grandma used to have her breakfast, lay an old leather-bound journal. I didn't remember seeing it before. Curiosity peaked. I opened it. The journal belonged to my grandmother, it detailed her life in Miller's Crossing, but towards the end, the entries became increasingly erratic and paranoid. She wrote about hearing strange noises at night, about feeling watched, and about something she referred to only as the Watcher. The last entry sent chills down my spine. The Watcher is coming for me. It knocks to warn me, to let me know it's near. I fear my time is running out. That night, the knocking started again. This time it was louder, more insistent. I followed the sound to the basement once more, my heart pounding in my chest. As I reached the bottom of the steps, the flashlight flickered and died, plunging me into darkness. Panic set in, and I fumbled for my phone to use its flashlight. When I finally managed to turn it on, I saw it. A figure stood in the far corner of the basement, barely visible in the dim light. It was tall and thin, its eyes glowing faintly. The knocking resumed louder and faster as the figure began to move towards me. I bolted up the stairs, slamming the basement door behind me. I could still hear the knocking, now accompanied by a low guttural growl. I didn't sleep at all that night, my grandmother's words echoing in my mind, the watcher is coming for me. The next day, I packed up my belongings and left Miller's Crossing, vowing never to return. I don't know what the watcher was or why it haunted my grandmother, but I couldn't shake the feeling that it was still out there, somewhere, waiting. To this day, I sometimes wake up in the middle of the night to the sound of knocking, and I wonder if the Watcher has finally found me. Part 2 After I left Miller's Crossing, I thought I could leave the Watcher behind. I moved back to the city, renting a small apartment and trying to put the past behind me. Life returned to normal or at least as normal as it could be after such an ordeal. But the knocking never truly left me. It would come sporadically, always at night, 
always when I was alone. Months passed and I started to believe it was all in my head. I even started seeing a therapist who assured me that trauma could manifest in strange ways. I was beginning to feel more at ease, starting to think that maybe, just maybe, I could move on. Then, one evening, I received a package in the mail. There was no return address, just my name written in a neat, old-fashioned script. I hesitated before opening it, a sense of dread creeping over me. Inside the package was an old photograph of my grandmother standing in front of the house at Miller's Creek, holding a baby. I recognized the baby as myself. Attached to the photo was a note. You can't escape what's in your blood. I dropped the photo and stepped back, my mind racing. How could someone know about the Watcher? My grandmother never spoke of it to anyone, and I had kept my own experiences to myself. That night, the knocking returned, louder and more persistent than ever. It seemed to come from all around me, echoing throughout the apartment. I tried to ignore it, to convince myself it was just my imagination, but the sound was unmistakable. Then came the growling. I couldn't stay in my apartment. Grabbing only my keys and phone, I fled driving aimlessly through the city until I ended up at a 24-hour diner. I sat there, drinking coffee and trying to calm my nerves until the sun came up. Over the next few days, I researched everything I could about the water. I dug through old town records folklore websites, and anything that might just give me a clue. One night, deep in an obscure forum, I found a post from someone in a neighboring town who described a similar entity, a tall, thin figure that knocked and growled, tormenting their family for generations. Desperate, I contacted the poster, a woman named Evelyn. We met at a small cafe on the outskirts of town. She looked tired, as if she hadn't slept in years. She listened as I recounted my experiences, nodding along as if she had heard it all before. You're not the first, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. The Watcher is an ancient entity, tied to certain bloodlines. Once it finds you, it never truly leaves. Is there any way to stop it? I asked, my voice trembling. There are ways to keep it at bay, she replied. Symbols, uh, rituals, protections passed down through the generations. But once it's attached to your bloodline, it will always come back. Evelyn showed me a series of protective symbols and explained the ritual that her family used to keep the Watcher at a distance. I thanked her and left, feeling a mixture of hope and fear. That night, I performed the ritual and placed the symbols around my apartment. The knocking didn't come, and for the first time in months, I slept peacefully. But peace was fleeting. A week later, I found a new note on my kitchen table. You can't hide forever. I realized then that I couldn't run from the Watcher. It would always find me, no matter where I went or what I did. My only hope was to learn more, to find a way to break the curse that had haunted my family for generations. And so, I returned to Miller's Crossing to the old Victorian house and the secrets it held. I had to face the Watcher head on to uncover the truth that my grandmother had hidden so well. Because if I didn't, I knew I would never be free. Part 3 Returning to Miller's Crossing felt like stepping back into a nightmare. The old Victorian house loomed ominously at the end of the street, its windows dark and lifeless. I parked my car and stayed at it for a long moment, summoning the courage to go inside. The protective symbols and rituals Evelyn had taught me 
were my only defense against the Watcher, and I clung to them like a lifeline. The house smelled of dust and decay, as if it had been abandoned for years rather than months. I made my way to the basement, the air growing colder with each step. The door creaked as I opened it, and I felt a chill run down my spine. The basement was just as I had left it, filled with old furniture and boxes of my grandmother's belongings. I set up candles around the room, placing the protective symbols in a circle. I began the ritual, chanting the words Evelyn had taught me. The air grew heavy, and I felt a presence watching me from the shadows. The knocking started again, but this time it was different, more insistent, more demanding. As I finished the ritual, the candles flickered and went out. The room plunged into darkness, and I heard the growling closer than ever before. My flashlight flickered to life, and I saw it. The watcher, standing at the edge of the circle. Its eyes glowed with a malevolent light, and its form seemed to shift and waver. You cannot banish me, it hissed, its voice echoing in my mind. I am bound to your blood. I will always find you. Summoning all the courage, I stepped forward, holding out the symbols. What do you want? I demanded. The Watcher paused, as if considering my question. You carry a curse, passed down through your family. Your grandmother tried to hide it, but she failed. The curse is tied to this house, to the land it stands on. To break it, you must understand its origin. With that, the figure vanished, leaving me alone in the dark. I knew what I had to do. I spent the next few days coming through my grandmother's journals and old town records, piecing together the history of the house and my family. I discovered that the land had once belonged to a man named Jonathan Miller, one of the town's founders. He had been accused of witchcraft and executed in the late 1600s, cursing the land and all who lived on it with his dying breath. My ancestors had unknowingly built their home on the cursed ground, and the Watcher was the manifestation of that curse. Armed with this knowledge, I sought out Evelyn once more. Together, we devised a plan to lift the curse. It required a powerful ritual, one that would break the bond between the Watcher and my bloodline. It was risky but it was my only hope. We prepared everything in the basement of the old house, setting up an intricate array of symbols and candles. As night fell, we began the ritual. The air grew heavy and the temperature dropped. The knocking started again, echoing throughout the house. The watcher appeared, its form more solid than ever before. It howled in rage as we chanted the words of the ritual, trying to break through the circle. The candles flickered wildly, and I felt a surge of energy building around us. With a final, desperate chant, the circle of symbols glowed brightly, and a shockwave of energy burst from the center. The watcher shrieked and dissolved into a cloud of darkness, which was sucked into the earth beneath the house. The air cleared, and the knocking stopped. For the first time, the house felt peaceful. The curse had been lifted. Evelyn and I stood in silence for a moment, taking in what we had accomplished. It's over, she said, her voice filled with relief. I nodded, feeling a weight lift from my shoulders. Thank you. I said, grateful beyond words. As I left Miller's Crossing for the last time, I knew that the Watcher was truly gone. The nightmare was over, and I could finally move on with my life. But I would never forget the terror I had faced 
or the strength it took to overcome it. The past would always be a part of me, but now, at least, it wouldn't control my future. The worst part of being in prison for me was not being able to see my son Toby. I missed him so much. He had sent me a letter, and it left me deeply concerned. I would do anything to be outside these thick walls surrounding me, to be with them. No mother should have to be away from her child, though it was far beyond my control. A picture of Toby hung on the wall of my cell. I looked up at it occasionally as I read his short letter over and over, causing the ink to smudge from my tears. To Sylvia White, prisoner number 464, sender Toby White. Hello, mummy. I really miss you. When am I going to see you? It is lonely here and very cold, and I have not seen any light, only dark now. My baby needed help. What kind of nightmare was he in? What did he mean by only dark greets me now? I wanted answers. I told one of the wardens about the letter, and he just shrugged it off like it was nothing. Like my child didn't matter, and everybody else I told did nothing to help either. That night, alone in my cell, I wrote to Toby. To Toby White, sender. Sylvia White, prisoner, number 464. What did you mean in the letter you sent me? Where are you? Whatever trouble you are in, Mommy will help you. I miss you so much. It was three days before I got a reply. Three agonizing long days of worrying about my son. When I saw the envelope with Toby's handwriting on it, I felt a slight bit of relief. To Sylvia White, prisoner number 464, sender Toby White. I am in a very cold, dark place. My blood has turned to ice, and when I lick it, it tastes like metal popsicle. You should come see me. There is enough popsicle for us both. My whole body is a popsicle. Hee <laughs> hee. Come to hell and join me. I broke down in tears after reading the letter. Something was wrong with my boy. I took the letter to one of the wardens again, this time with determination to make them help me. I would starve myself to death if I had to. I approached the warden with the letter in my hand. My boy, he is in trouble. You have got to send someone to help him. I'm begging you, I said, holding the letter up. The warden didn't help. He pushed me aside and gave me an angry look before getting right up in my face and with a quiet yet rage-filled tone, he said, Now you listen, bitch. You know Toby is dead. And you know damn well that you killed him. You cut the poor little boy to pieces and hid him in two separate freezers. And I cannot wait to hear about the day you fucking die. Now get the fuck out of my face and go find somewhere to rot. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these horrific falsity stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Elias, Adina B, Donna, Les Crispin, Samantha Place, Coleman Carter, Corpse Lover, Stephanie McLaren, Denise S, Tina Mee, Tammy Slayton, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Amy Klimko, and Haunted. Thank you all once again for remaining the pillars on which this channel stands. I can't thank you enough, and I send knuckles and hugs to all of you. To the other subscribers and members and maybe newbies that popped in to listen. Thank you so much for your support and thank you. And I hope you've enjoyed this video. So if you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection.
Until next time, please stay safe out there and take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.